As we begin this morning, I want to focus our attention on the difference between a fire pit and a wildfire. A fire pit and a wildfire. Think about this for a moment. A fire pit, the fire is contained in a very small area, whereas a wildfire is difficult to contain. In a fire pit, fire is controlled with measured fuel, maybe two or three pieces of wood, whereas a wildfire is uncontrollable, and it, and it gains speed and gains power, gains force, consuming more and more as it goes. With a fire pit, you can extinguish that fire pretty quickly. All you need is a bucket of water or a, a garden hose. Whereas with a wildfire, it's almost impossible to extinguish it until it burns out on its own. The largest wildfire recorded in history occurred not that long ago, one of the hottest known summers when blazes on the taiga of eastern Siberia spread and destroyed 55 million acres of land. Imagine that. That's twice the size of the state of Illinois. A wildfire. Our text this morning is the story of a wildfire. If you have your Bible, let me encourage you to open to John chapter 4. It's the story of the, the contagious faith of an unlikely follower of Jesus. John chapter 4, verses 1 through 45, tell us the story of Jesus' encounter with a woman from Samaria. The story gives us a glimpse into how the gospel crosses barriers and brings life to the most unlikely of people. People far from the typical reach of religious people. FYI, if you're sitting in this service this morning, you're somewhat religious. I mean, hey, you're at church, right? You're somewhat religious. You have religious patterns to your behavior. There are people who are far beyond the scope of religious people thrust into the margins by every aspect of her identity, this Samaritan woman's encounter with Jesus, her encounter with Jesus, a woman who exists in the shadows, her encounter with Jesus is genuine, authentic, and it convinces a whole community that they too ought to be following Jesus. Again, it's the story of the contagious faith of an unlikely follower. What's the relevance to us? I'm just going to tell you this up front. The relevance to us. I believe that one of the greatest tragedies in the world of Christendom is our unending proclivity to institutionalize the gospel. We build a fire pit, and then we tell ourselves it's a wildfire. We build a fire pit, tell ourselves it's a wildfire, as if by instinct we reduce being Christian to building buildings, to developing moral codes, and to a perverse form of spiritual elitism. And yet the true gospel, the true gospel, the true encounter with the true Christ is unbounded. It permeates our world and it, and it brings life to the most unlikely of people, spreading like a wildfire to unlikely followers. My intent with this morning's message is simply to tell the story. It's a long story. It's 45 verses the story is lengthy, so we're not going to read every verse. However, as we go, I'm going to dip in and, and highlight various, various phrases, various words, and call attention to those things as we, as we hear the story unfold and as we hear its significance within the context of John chapter 4. God help us. Our story opens with Jesus and his disciples making a three-day journey from Judea in the south to so, uh, to, to, to Galilee in the north. You can see it on the, on the map there. From Judea in the south to Galilee in the north, according to verse 4, Jesus had to pass through Samaria. You can just see it, right? From Judea to Galilee, you got to pass through Samaria. If you know anything about biblical history, you'll remember something about Samaria, perhaps. In 722 B.C., the Assyrians, sorry, Carol, I see you out there. I'm not picking on the Assyrians. We got another one up here in the front, Joe, not picking on the Assyrians. Uh, in 722 B.C., the Assyrians captured Samaria. Samaria was the capital of the northern kingdom of Israel. Remember, Israel and Judah had divided after King Solomon. Saul, David, Solomon. After Solomon's reign, the kingdom divided into two parts, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. 
the northern kingdom was, was basically decimated by the Assyrians in 722 B.C. 722 B.C., the Assyrians capture Samaria, and they resettle Samaria with foreigners. And so these remaining Israelites in the north commingled with foreigners. Together, this remaining population is partly Jewish, but not completely. And so this remaining population, partly Jewish, not completely, they develop its own version of the Jewish religion. They claim the first five books of the Old Testament, that we call the Samaritan Pentateuch, the first five books. They even build a rival temple on Mount Gerizim, again in the north. That temple was eventually destroyed in about uh, 100 years before the, the birth of Jesus. But again, we've got a people who have their own version of the Jewish faith because they're Jewish, but not completely Jewish. Nonetheless, the land itself had tremendous history. In our text, verse 6, Jacob's well was there. There was a well there uh, that, that, that came um, from Jacob all the way back to the story of Jacob in the book of Genesis. Jacob, that patriarch, Abraham, Isaac, and then Jacob, Genesis, Jacob's well was there. Where? In Samaria, in this place. And there was also a plot of land that, that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. In fact, after the, the story of the Exodus in the book of Exodus, Joseph's body is buried in the very same place where our story takes place this morning, about 100 yards away from the location of this well. So this is a place that has tremendous history going way back. This was a place with history and traditions, perhaps even some encrusted entitlement that had been built up over the centuries because of religious experiences from the past. Uh, many years ago, I traveled to various sections of Europe. Um, I think it might be an occupational hazard, but when I travel, I like to look at churches. I like to go visit churches that I've seen in textbooks and history books, places where significant decisions have been made in the past. I, I enjoy seeing those places in real life. So there in Europe and various places, I went to see these churches, places where I'd heard such powerful things happen. And what I encountered in these places, these places was such deep, historic, Christian roots. What I encountered was that these places were now museums. They were artifacts of the past. Yeah, the history was there. Yeah, there might have been some sense of religious entitlement because of those experiences of the past. But the places, the, of them, the places themselves were only artifacts devoid of the presence of Jesus. Into the ancient artifact of a Samaritan town called Sychar, Jesus shows up. Jesus shows up weary from his journey. Remember that three-day journey to get to the north. And there at the well, Jacob's well, his disciples leave him there so that they can go into the town to find food. It's midday. It's hot, the hottest part of the day. It's the time when Jesus ought to be able to have a little siesta because no one else ought to be going out to the well. No one else would be going to fetch water in the hottest part of the day. That is, unless you're a, per a person who's trying to avoid other people. Well, a woman approaches the well. Verse 7 of our text, Jesus says to the woman, give me a drink. Four words, give me a drink. And the woman responds, how is it that you, a Jew, ask me for a drink, a woman of Samaria? Just like that, with four words, Jesus crosses over so many boundaries. With four words, he crosses over boundaries and perimeters that have been established for a long time. You see, Jews didn't eat with Samaritans. And not only was she a Samaritan, but she was a female Samaritan. Within a generation, Jewish teachings would develop that that. that, 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 that basically declared that Samaritan women from birth were in a perpetual state of uncleanness. To be a Samaritan was bad. To be a Samaritan woman, stay far away. So this woman, she looks at him and says, how could you ask me for a drink? How could a Jewish man be asking her for a drink? 
I want you to think for a moment about all the barriers, all the boundaries that we create for the sake of protecting our experience of religion. Just like the ideologies reflected in this text, we are inclined to dehumanize people who do not fit within our comfortable enclaves. Can I say that again? Think for a moment about the barriers that Christians like to create for the sake of protecting our experience of religion. Just like the ideologies reflected in this text, we are inclined. It's like it's hardwired into us to dehumanize those who do not fit comfortably into our little enclaves. I would call this a form of religious contempt. I'm reminded of a story a man that I met many years ago in Rwanda. He was a guy that I lifted weights with at the gym. That was when I had, like, you know, muscles and stuff. I remember this experience uh, with this man in the gym where I exercised. I would go into that place. It was three miles to get from my house to the office, and I would stop a mile and a half in. I was riding a motorcycle, and I would stop in there, and it was a great time to be able to just kind of have some solitude in the gym. Uh, and... The, the, the employees of this gym love to play the absolute worst of American rap. Uh, Carol, I'm looking at you. I know what you think about rap. Uh, I mean, it was, this was the worst stuff ever. Like, you know, all sorts of bad words that you're not supposed to say ever. And so I would just go into the gym. I wouldn't make any apologies or even ask for permission. I would just go up to the CD player, play, press eject, take the CD out, and toss it in the trash. And then I would take out my Jesus culture was my... My music of preference, Sherry, yeah, drop that in there. And I turn it up extra loud, loving it, loving it. Uh, and I remember one time this, this, uh, this, this guy came up to me, an Asian guy came up, and he said, why did you throw that in the trash? Or he said, why did you throw that away? I said, because it's garbage. The garbage should be thrown away. <laughs> and he didn't speak very good English, but a, a couple of days later he came back and says, why did you call this garbage? It's a CD. You know, he's thinking garbage is like the leftover, the waste, you know. And I said, because of the words and the lyrics. And this man and I started to develop a friendship. His name was, he, call, he called himself Mr. Lee. Turns out, so we're having this conversation one day. And all, the conversations only ever happened when the music was loud. Because there was, there was another person, also of Asian descent, in the room. And he waited until we were far away. One day, he asked me, he says, where are you from? I said, I'm from the United States. Where are you from? He says, I'm from Korea. So what part of Korea, north or south? He says, Korea. <laughs> Which you know what that means, right? That's North Korea. And he would only talk to me when the music was loud. He would only talk to me when, it, when he felt like he was safe. And I remember him telling me one time, he says, I remember when the missionaries were still in my country. He says, people were better then. People were better when they had religion. He says, my own children do shameful things. He said, I think it would be different if there were Christians in my country. Beautiful thing, there he was, probably a part of a military attache in Rwanda, helping out to train the military. Uh, and he would watch uh, the Christian Broadcasting Network on satellite television in his hotel room. And I thought, that, how creative is God, right? And I remember, uh, this is probably early, like 2010 or something like that, Mr. Lee went missing. It was the same time that uh, Kim Jong-il died. And Mr. Lee went missing for about a month. When he came back, Kim Jong-un was then in power. And um, I, I had, in this, this interval of time, secured a Bible in Korean. And I was so excited to give it to Mr. Lee. So when the music was blaring, I pulled him aside. I said, Mr. Lee, I'd like to have some tea with you. I have a Bible for you. And he looked at me, and he said, your country hates my country. And my country hates your country. He said, we cannot be friends until our countries are friends. It broke my heart. Here is a man for whom Christ died, and yet nonetheless he was cut off because of man-made boundaries. How twisted is that? And that comes from politics. How much more twisted is that when that comes from the people of God? Nonetheless, Jesus crosses those boundaries. Jesus crosses the boundaries. And he offers to this woman living water. Living water. 
Ezekiel chapter 47, Jesus, or in Ezekiel chapter 47, the, uh, God describes uh, through the vision, Ezekiel has this vision of living water. 400 or so years before Jesus is born, there's this vision in Ezekiel 47 of living water. And I think that's what Jesus is referring to here in the text. Flowing out of the temple in Jerusalem. Flowing out of the temple in Jerusalem. Deep water flows over the mountains surrounding areas. Deep water flows from Jerusalem. And it goes and it goes and it flows and it flows all the way even until the, the salty Dead Sea. You know what they call the Dead Sea the Dead Sea? Because nothing grows in it. It's a dead place. Salt water in this vision will become fresh water. Listen to the language of Ezekiel 47. On the banks, on both sides of the river, this water gushing forth, there will grow all kinds of trees for food. This is living water. Their leaves will not wither, nor will their fruit fail, but they will bear fresh fruit every month because the water for them flows from the sanctuary, the presence of God. Their fruit will be food. And their leaves will be for healing. Jesus offers this woman living water because he is the living water. He is the one who brings healing. Verse 15, the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water. Now you might remember the story of Nicodemus in John chapter 3. John chapter 3 Jesus has this conversation with Nicodemus, chapter 3, verses 1 through 15. Nicodemus was a religious guy, spiritually educated dude, in Jerusalem, representing the Sanhedrin, not nonetheless. The story of Nicodemus closes with a lot of uncertainties. We don't know where Nicodemus, this religious guy, will land with respect to the invitation to be born again. Now, we read later chapters, and we know that Nicodemus hangs around, and we assume that he becomes a follower, but we have nothing explicit in chapter 3 to tell us anything about his reaction in that moment. Yet this woman, yet this woman, yet this woman who exists in the shadows, her knee-jerk reaction is to say to Jesus, give me this water. This woman who is marginalized, creeping in the periphery of mainstream religion, she hears about it and she wants it. But the invitation to drink living water is not the invitation to leave you where you are. Have you ever had, gone through a significant period of time where maybe you haven't eaten or drank anything, and then you put something in your body, it's like you come alive? You're like, whoa, sugar, <laughs> feeling good. Uh, the invitation to drink living water is the invitation to come to life. It's the invitation of transformation. Jesus is not going to leave this woman the same. So Jesus tells her, go call your husband. Go call your, let's have your husband come and join us. You know, like, well, we'll make this a three-way phone call. Let's bring, bring your husband to us. And this woman says, I, I have no husband. Jesus knows this. Do you remember the story about Jesus and Nathaniel in chapter 1? When Jesus calls Nathaniel, he says to Nathaniel, I saw you when you were all by yourself, when you thought you were all by yourself under the fig tree. I saw you there. You see, Jesus knows everything. Jesus knows everybody. And he knew all about this woman. He knew all about her. Ha. Huh. He says, yeah, I know you don't have a husband. You've had five husbands. And the guy that you're living with right now, he's not your husband either. Isn't it impressive that Jesus knows that? And ha, there he is with her. I love that. Jesus knows her, but she doesn't yet know him. And so she says to him in verse 19, Sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. In other words, yeah, I can tell that you know something about my sin. God has exposed you stuff about me. You, are, you must be a prophet. You've exposed my sin just as a prophet would expose, preach something about that, you know, that, that gets to the core of who I am. But you see, awareness of sin leads to concern for forgiveness. Once you're aware that you've, that you've fallen short, you're, you're concerned, how do I get forgiveness? And she wants to know, how am I gonna, how's my sin going to be atoned for? How am I, how's my sin going to be fixed? My sin problem, how will it be fixed? And so the conversation shifts to 
to worship. Sometimes when we read uh, John chapter 4, we think of this se- section as like Jesus having a theological diatribe with a woman at a, at a well. No, no, no. This is very focused on this woman's position of shame needing forgiveness. You see, the Jews had their temple in the south. The Samaritans had had their temple in the north, but that temple had been destroyed. And so now with the exposure of her shame, she wants to know, how is atonement going to be made? How am I going to be forgiven for my sin? How am I going to be forgiven? Jesus responds to her in verse 24. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The forgiveness offered to sinners is not contained in a building. The sacrifice of animals will never be enough. Fullness of life, living water, is not found in in, in religion or in the accoutrements of religion. That forgiveness and that atonement is found in Jesus. So she declares, she knows something, that she's waiting for something. In verse 25, she says, when the Messiah comes, he will tell us all things. Like, I know there's somebody coming, and maybe he can fix the problem because I feel so marginalized and cut off. And Jesus says, I who speak to you am he. Could you imagine that moment? Again, we need to be clear what the story is showing us. The gospel is being declared to a very unlikely follower. A woman. A marginalized woman. Marginalized because of her gender. Marginalized because of her ethnicity. Marginalized by her own behavior. But take careful note of this. In spite of the identity politics of the day, in spite of the hard-baked prejudices of the day, Jesus is her Savior. Think for a moment of all the people that exist within the margins, the shadows. Jesus is their Savior too. The faith of this unlikely follower spreads like wildfire. Remember, that's kind of the illustration with which we opened. Wildfire. She leaves. I I think this is so cool. She went there for water. She had her pot. She leaves it at the well, and she just, she says, I got new water. And she goes back to her village. She goes back to her, her town calling everyone who will hear, come see a man who told me everything I've ever done. Come see a man. Her profound experience with Jesus spills over into the work of evangelism. Come and see. Come and see. Oh, how careful we have to be to not lose sight of this one thing that should get us excited. Come and see. Come and see. The invitation is not, come and see our really cool church. We got an A-frame and everything. Come and see our amazing worship band, which are awesome. Come and see, you know, we got new chairs. Come and see Jesus. Come and see Jesus. The disciples, having returned from foraging for food, remember they were just, they were just down the road in the town looking for food for Jesus. They just left them there to get a little siesta. They had no idea what had happened. Then they come back with food and they want Jesus to eat. <laughs> and he looks at them and says that he'd already eaten. They don't understand. And he says to them in verse 35, Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see. The fields are white for harvest. It's as if he's saying to his disciples, The whole world is full of people just like this Samaritan woman. And the very same thing is true in our day, friends. People who do not look like you, people who do not think like you, people whose personal decisions might cause you to cross the road and walk on a different sidewalk, people who might make you feel uncomfortable, people who you think don't belong, who are illegal, illegitimate, illicit. But Jesus is their Savior. Jesus is the living water. The only living water who brings life to all people. And it is the privilege of us who follow in the footsteps of Jesus to bring the gospel to the most unlikely of places. John closes the story by telling us in verse 39, many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. Many Samaritans. 
<laughs> Imagine that. Oh, these people, they just keep on coming. Like one I could tolerate, but more? <laughs> Imagine that church service. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. The contagious faith of an unlikely follower. And then to the extent that the townspeople approached this woman, they said to her in verse 42, It is no longer because of you that we believe. For we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this indeed is the Savior of the world. And this is a gospel movement to be imitated in our day. Have you ever heard of the nuns? Not the nuns with the, you know, not those nuns. I mean the N-O-N-E nuns, the nuns. In January of this year, the Pew Research Center published a study on religious nuns, who they are and what they believe. Nuns, N-O-N-E-S. According to statistics, 28% of, religious, or 28% of U.S. adults, 28%, over one in four U.S. adults, describe their religion as nothing in particular. None. Nothing in particular. This number is growing, friends. It's growing. They believe in God, but they do not attend church. They are critical of organized religion, many having had bad experiences in church. Anybody know a nun out there? Uh, maybe you love a lot of these people. Maybe you work with a lot. Maybe you have these as neighbors, these nuns. But here's the point. They're not here. They're not here this morning. They're not here. They're out there. They are at the wells in the middle of the day. Jesus did not come to build an institutionalized religion. Our mission is not to propagate a religious culture. We are not crusaders seeking to colonize the people around us. No, just like Jesus, we go to the wells. We go to the wells. And we go to the wells in the heat of the day, and we introduce people to the living water of Jesus. That is what it means to be a follower of Jesus. This is the story of the contagious faith of an unlikely follower. Man, I love this story. Jesus crosses barriers and brings life to the most unlikely people. He does it here to a Samaritan woman. And then that woman, having had such a genuine, genuine and authentic and convincing experience with Jesus, he, she then she brings her testimony to the community. And just like that, the whole community follows Jesus. We've got to be so careful, friends, in the context of church not to fall into the trap of erecting barriers that keep people from Jesus. So before we close, I want to offer a few points of application in reflection on this story. What should our attitude be? Just three reflections, just quickly, so that you've got something to talk about with God this afternoon. Number one, see your own unworthiness. This woman's excitement to tell, Jesus, tell other people about Jesus began with her own awareness of her deep unworthiness to receive Jesus. When she returned to her village, she did not take her old pot from the well. No, she went home with living water and the message of Jesus. Guard your heart. And in your heart, guard that sense of awe for what Jesus has done for you. There was a time when you were at the well as well. So see your own unworthiness. You're no better, and I'm no better than that Samaritan woman. Number two, root out spiritual elitism. Spiritual elitism is the belief that our version of spirituality is intrinsically better than another. The greatest barrier to the gospel is elitism by which we make secondary issues primary and our cultural version of Christianity preferable. Root out spiritual elitism. And then number three, the third thing I would encourage you to take before the Lord today you know, sometimes people go home, and on the way home, they, they, uh, they, they, they roast the pastor, roast pastor for lunch. No, talk to the Lord about this. Look for faith among unlikely followers. Who will go to Jacob's well? Who among us is willing and ready to cross barriers and go into Samaria? Samaria is not a comfortable place. Samaria is not the people who look just like you who live next door to you. Remember, Samaria involves crossing boundaries, finding those people who live within the shadows, who probably won't respond to the invitation to come on a Sunday morning. Who is going to Jacob's well? Who will seek after those who are not seeking after Jesus? 
Friends, let us not be found guilty of cutting off anyone for whom Christ died. The contagious faith of an unlikely follower is like a wildfire. It's a movement that cannot be stopped. I opened with the illustration of fire. Let me close with the illustration of water. The Mill River Dam in Williamsburg, Massachusetts, was constructed under lax regulations with shoddy workmanship until on May 16, 1874, the dam failed and 600, 600 million gallons of water flowed for eight miles, taking out four towns. Can you envision the power of 600 million gallons of water flowing for eight miles? The contagious faith of an unlikely follower. A community of people who will go to Jacob's well is like the break of a dam. And it spreads living water into every crack and crevice as it goes. Heavenly Father, give us big vision to be imitators of Jesus. Free us, Lord, from the, the ways in which we make religion about us. God, would you give to us this burden to bring living water to the people around us. Thank you, Father, for the invitation. Thank you, Father, for seeing us and for coming to us. And Lord, would you just motivate us and move us in the direction of seeing others. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.